So I want to say welcome to the Cold War Truth Commission, a day of education, testimony, and action. It's an honor and privilege and a responsibility uh, to be here today. My name is Rachel Brunke, and I'm president of the board of directors of Witness for Peace Southwest. Sincere people, we know and we believe from Congress or, or even common Americans are really asking themselves, what happened on January 6th? How did we become such a, a violent and dysfunctional and lied to and lying country? And we believe today that our testifiers will be providing a lot of that answer. Our mission with the Cold War Truth Commission is to continue exposing US illegal and immoral actions in the name of anti-communism at home and abroad. We seek to show how today's perverse violence and injustice, both at home and abroad, are intimately tied up to the perpetration of the US Cold War, both historically and ongoing today. We believe that unraveling the web of lies and beginning a formal truth telling on this issue will help the people in the US and around the world understand. Without truth about the US Cold War, there can be no true reconciliation for our times. The Cold War Truth Commission, because it was never recognized and because it is still happening. Let the trial begin. Frank, to you. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks so much. Hello, everybody. My name is Frank Doro, and I'm an anti-war peace and justice activist. We are here today to talk about the big lie that we live here in the United States. We have many important truth tellers who will be testifying to the illegal and immoral wars this country has waged against many poor and defenseless countries around the world, resulting in the deaths of between 20 to 30 million people during the so-called Cold War. Because right now we're gonna show a clip, a video clip of former attorney Ramsey Clark. And uh, I'll just tell you a little bit of Ramsey Clark. Uh, he was attorney general uh, uh, of the United States under LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson. After he left that position, he went to Vietnam and he saw what he was doing there and he became an anti-war activist of the highest level. This video clip we're going to see is an edited version of a talk Ramsey gave in 1998 at the Holman Methodist Church, the Church of the Reverend James Lawson. Uh, I was there that night. It's titled, uh, this talk is titled Plutocracy, Wealth Governs This Country. And I wanna say this was filmed by Ralph Cole and it's part of my film, what I'm going to do about this foreign policy, what you're going to see. And due to the health reasons, Ramley, Ramsey could not be with us here tonight. But here's this eight minute clip of Ramsey Clark. If you think it's been a long evening, <clears throat> wait till I get through. <laughs> but we're going to have to take some long evenings because this planet is deeply troubled and the greatest cause of that trouble is our own government. In the speech that James, Reverend James Lawson referred to that Martin Luther King made on April the 5th, 1967, the most startling thing that he said at the time, the thing that caused the most anger and hatred to be directed toward him, was this sentence. The greatest purveyor of violence on earth is my own government. 31 years ago, why anyone would have been startled is hard to say because it was an obvious fact, but apparently we need more education in the obvious than we do examination of the obscure and unknown. Last year, U.S. military expenditures, with all the suffering on the planet, all the sickness and hunger and ignorance and pain. <clears throat> the American military budget was $265 billion. The second largest government expenditure for militarism 
was 48 billion. And that was the Russian Federation. In the United States military expenditures exceed those of the top 12 government expenditures on earth by themselves and are more than a third of all the military expenditures on the planet. We have a war party in this country and we've had it all along. And you can call it Democrat for a while, you can call it Republican for a while, but it has been the special economic interests in this society that have governed us from the time that we founded our governments on this continent. And the people have never controlled those governments. We call ourselves the world's greatest democracy. We are absolutely a plutocracy. It's the most obvious thing in the world. Wealth governs this country. And wealth uses military violence to control the rest of the world as best it can. And we're responsible. And we will pay the price for it. If we don't control our violence, if we don't control the effect of the symbol of our glorification of violence, on our children and on the rest of the planet, uh, then this human species is going to be the first to destroy itself completely. And that's the road the United States government has put us on. The single most pertinent statement on this issue was by Henry Kissinger. When the Iran-Iraq war began, over a million very young men lost their lives in that war. Henry Kissinger said at the beginning of the war, eight years of war, I hope they kill each other. And that was exactly our policy. What could be better? <laughs> Have them kill each other. Then who has to worry about that region anymore, you know? And don't think that's not exactly our policy. All over the world where there are poor peoples living today, that's the solution to overpopulation. Call it triage, whatever you want to call it. Let them kill each other, let them die. And they're dying all over Asia, Africa, and Latin America, where the masses of poor people live. They're expendable there as they are expendable here. As appalling as what we've done and what we've threatened to Iraq, the worst violence that all of our technology could unleash, and then the strangulation of the sanctions, the thing we have to realize is it's what our government leadership has been doing all along. It's not terribly different than how we addressed the folks that were here to meet the Mayflower standing on the dock, the North American Aboriginal peoples, the Indians as we call them. A long, steady course of destruction of those peoples. It's not terribly different than what we did to the slaves who were brought over in chains from Africa, those that survived the transit, which wasn't easy. You look in our history books, you don't read about a Philippine-American war. You read the Philippine history books, and they know about a Philippine-American war. We call it the Spanish-American war. We were liberating the Filipinos. We kill more than a million. Now we're bragging about the <clears throat> covert actions we're going to engage in against Iraq. Do you doubt for a minute that they're planning covert actions in half a dozen other places right now? That we'll react to them five years after the misery has begun and the people have been devastated? What we have to realize is that if we don't stand up and stop this now, if we can't stop these sanctions in Iraq, and if with them we can't prohibit any further use of sanctions that are designed to impact on the poor, then there are no poor people on the planet that will ever be safe from our government and its future acts. It's imperative that we stop them in Iraq today and that we prohibit them in the future as applied to any people, because it is a weapon of mass destruction. We have to stop military interventions by our government completely. We cannot permit more U.S. military interventions in foreign countries. We have to stop economic interventions. We've got to cancel foreign debt that has enslaved most of the poor countries of the planet. Cancel it. So let's organize through every 
effort and opportunity we have in our families, in our churches, in our mosques, in our synagogues, and in our schools, and at our jobs, a massive coalition committed to end militarism and economic exploitation by our government. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Ramsey Clark. He mentioned um, Native American, the genocide and land theft against Native Americans. And um, we are here in Los Angeles on Gabrielino Tongva land. So our next testimony will be from Jim Lafferty. Jim Lafferty is the Executive Director Emeritus of the National Lawyers Guild in Los Angeles, host of the Lawyers Guild show on KPFK, and a member of the governing board of the ACLU of Southern California. Jim has, over the past 55 years, played a national leadership role in major anti-war and civil rights movements. Jim? Hi, Rachel. Well, Frank, Rachel, thank you so much. Those who have organized uh, this, this really comprehensive uh, war crimes tri you know, tribunal, if you will, commission on the Cold War, I think did so on behalf of exposing the lies and common misconceptions about the Cold War and what I'm going to try to do in anticipation of hearing from a wide array of highly knowledgeable speakers is to raise some of the critically important questions about the Cold War that call for answers and understanding and to flag, to flag in advance some of the key lies and myths that today's speakers will no doubt explore more fully. When historians speak of the Cold War, they're generally talking of that period from 1947 to 1991. And it's called a Cold War because the United States and the former Soviet Union, as well as China, were not in direct military conflict with one another. But I contend, therefore, that the very first lie or myth that must be laid to rest about the Cold War is that it was a Cold War because there was nothing cold about it. In fact, estimates of the death toll linked to the Cold War, as I think Frank mentioned, run from 20 to 25 million people. By estimating the tally from related civil wars, interventions, genocides, in which the former Soviet Union and the United States often played a pivotal role. As such, the Cold War was ranked as the ninth deadliest in world history, and the United States bears the responsibility for the great majority of those deaths. This horrific death toll is in major part a direct consequence of the fact that although the United States was not engaging in a direct military war with the Soviets or China during the Cold War, didn't mean the three nations were not at military war with each other by proxy. By supporting and arming one side or another in one or more of other nations' civil wars that took place over the course of the Cold War. Think of the millions. Think of the millions who died in Korea and Vietnam, both militarily and, and civilian deaths. Does anyone doubt that the death toll of those civil wars would have been far lower had the two sides in those civil wars not had the backing, military and otherwise, of the world's two major powers, as well as China? I saw the evidence of this firsthand in 1971, while North Vietnam uh, was still at war. I was in Hanoi at the time. Um, I was visiting the War Museum at, at one day in, in Hanoi where I could clearly see written on the fragments of the munitions in that museum made in the USA. Further proof that the Cold War was not truly cold is found in the answer to this question. Can acts of a government other than military acts constitute acts of war? Well, for instance, what about sanctions that Ramsey was just talking about? Sanctions imposed by the United States on nations like Cuba and, and, and Iraq and Iran and on and on it goes. Uh, they've caused hundreds of thousands of deaths, if not more, and injuries primarily to civilians in those sanctioned countries. Are not then imposing sanctions acts of war? How about refusals? Uh, how about embargoes, blockades, uh, refusals to trade with unfavored nations? All of these non-military actions cause death 
and destruction as surely as do bombs and guns and tanks. And as I say, it's the United States that's responsible uh, still uh, for much of the starvation in North Korea caused by our continuing sanctions there imposed on that nation even after the end of the military conflict in the Korean War. Are we not responsible for some of the suffering in Iran? And think about the life destroying sanctions and embargoes we're now putting in place and now in place against Venezuela. What about political interference and sabotage conducted by Cold War countries? Was not the United States orchestrated overthrow of Muhammad Mossadegh in 1953, the first democratically elected uh, prime minister of Iran, an act of war? Or our aid and backing of the 1973 military overthrow of the Salvador Allende government in Chile? Now, there are other myths about the Cold War that today's fine speakers will no doubt talk about. The notion that it brought stability to the world and, and halted the proliferation of nuclear arms and all of that nonsense. But I wanna turn now to this. In the United States, we were told it was because we had to stop communism before it reached our shores. Remember the uh, shores, remember the, uh, the uh, you know, so-called domino effect. And so in the name of stopping the spread of communism to our shores, we not only experienced McCarthyism era, witch hunts ruining untold numbers of American lives at home, we also sent our sons and daughters to die in foreign lands in Korea and in Vietnam. And we spent trillions of dollars on military hardware and equipment that should have been spent on domestic needs instead of making obscene profits for corporate America. Now, a second lie or or myth is the claim that the Cold War ended in conjunction with the collapse of the Soviet Union. But does anyone seriously doubt that the United States is still engaged in a Cold War? A Cold War with Russia and not all, now also China? I mean, just this past week, President Biden called Vladimir Putin, Putin a killer and promised reprisals for Russia's alleged interference in the 2020 presidential election. And now corporate America has got behind the notion the government has got to spend over $27 billion in new anti-China military readiness in response to Admiral Philip Davidson's belief. And I quote, China is the strategic threat of the century to the US, close quote. The top officials in the Biden administration, including Biden himself, agree with him. Now, this is not just a democratic Republican thing. This is a capitalist thing. And so the never ending arms race and the profits to be made from it continues and gains more speed. And think it's about scary. how the Cold War nations are still waging proxy wars with one another in places like Syria and Yemen and the cyber wars now taking place between the major powers as well. But we've got to dig deeper still to understand why the ruling elite in the United States so desperately needs a boogeyman to frighten the American people with be it Russia or China and thereby continue the Cold War. Because no matter how far those countries have strayed from true communism, making them the boogeyman still provides political cover for the United States, political cover for corporate America to continue its imperialism, to continue gobbling up the resources of weaker nations in the name of ever greater corporate profits, be those the resources of capitalist nations or pseudo communist nations. Well, this in turn makes it very clear to me that the Cold War is and always has been a class war, a class war throughout this world and here in the United States as well. And exposing this truth and then building a powerful enough movement to replace the greedy and corporate capitalist economic system with a socialist one must surely be our goal. And this in turn is why this Cold War Truth Commission is so critically important. The world is in crisis, brought about largely by hundreds of years of capitalist caused wars and spoilation. Neo-fascism is again on the rise at home and abroad. Our planet, our home, is in danger of becoming unable to sustain life due to our despoiled environment. But what we must remember, if we are not to give up in despair, is that we have won great victories over these same evils in the past and that therefore history itself is on our side. Yes, we've got to remember that things can change 
if we have the will to change them. Today, yeah, America is a divided country. But ironically, in that division may lie the best hope and opportunity we've had in generations to finally make America the kind of socially and economically just country it can be. Because while the stakes have never been higher, neither has the awareness of so many in our nation that our capitalist system is failing our people. So as you listen to today's inspiring activists and knowledgeable speakers vow to join the growing movement to form a more massive and more united movement, a movement for true progressive and liberating change. And as you join this effort, vow to remember that with history on our side, we the people at long suffering last can and will finally make America the America of our dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Our next um, speaker is going to also present a short video clip and I will introduce um, him as well as uh, uh, the person who made the video clip with him. So Peter Kuznick um, and Oliver Stone together made the video clip that you are about to see. Peter Kuznick is professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. He and Oliver Stone co-authored the New York Times bestselling book, and Showtime documentary series, both titled The Untold History of the United States, the graphic novel of which will be out later this year. Oliver Stone has made many famous movies. Frank believes that his film JFK is the most important American mainstream movie ever made. His film Born on the Fourth of July, The True Story of Ron Kovic is one of the very best anti-war films ever made. He made the important documentary titled South of the Border, and he made the 12-part series titled The Untold History of the United States. His film Platoon won the Academy Award for Best Picture in 1989. So here is Peter Kuznick to introduce the clip of the film and to discuss it. Hi, Rachel. Thank you. Um, I was asked today to talk about Henry Wallace and the origins of the Cold War. Wallace, as some of you know, has been largely written out of history. He's an extraordinary man. And one of the themes that Oliver and I were pursuing in Untold History was that the Cold War was not inevitable. It was insane, but it was not inevitable. So let me talk for a few minutes about Henry Wallace. Wallace was born in Iowa in 1888 to a distinguished farm family. His father was Secretary of Agriculture in the Harding and Coolidge administrations. And Roosevelt chose him to be Secretary of Agriculture for the New Deal. When Wallace took over, the farm total farm income in 1932 was one third of what it had been in 1929. Arthur Schlesinger just says that he was a great Secretary of Agriculture, the best we've ever had. So he was also the leading anti-fascist in those New Deal administrations. So when Roosevelt was going to run for a third term in 1940, he wanted Wallace on the ticket as vice president. He said, we need a real anti-fascist, a real progressive as vice president because we're about to fight a war against fascism. Uh, but the problem was that the party bosses did not want Wallace on the ticket because his views were too radical. Roosevelt wrote an extraordinary letter to the Democratic Convention, turning down the nomination for president. He said, we already have one Wall Street dominated party in the United States, the Republican Party. If the Democratic Party is not going to be a progressive party fighting for social justice, then it has no reason to exist. And I'm not going to run on, on that ticket. He was about to send the letter when Ellen Roosevelt went to the floor of the convention, convinced them that he was serious, and they begrudgingly put Wallace on the ticket as vice president. He was an extraordinary vice president from 1941 to 1945. When Henry Luce wrote his editorial that the 20th century must be the American century, that the US will dominate the world in every way, Wallace responded with a famous speech called The Century of the Common Man. It said the 20th century should not be the American century, it should be the century of the common man. And he called for a worldwide people's revolution in the tradition of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the German Revolution, the Latin American revolutions. He called for a cooperation between the US and the Soviets. 
uh, end to imperialism, end to colonialism, end to economic exploitation, and spreading the fruits of science and technology around the world. That was Wallace's vision as vice president. By 1944, when uh, it looked like Roosevelt was gonna run for his fourth term, the party bosses who were much more conservative were very nervous about Wallace being on the ticket because they knew Roosevelt was not gonna last another term and that Wallace would become the next president. So they staged what the party treasurer, Edwin Pauley called Pauley's coup. Uh, Pauley was a California oil millionaire who said, I entered politics when I realized it was cheaper to elect a new Congress than to buy up the old Congress. And so he entered politics and they staged this coup to try to get Wallace off the ticket. It looked like it was all set because it was not very pro uh, democratic in the convention to that point. However, uh, there was one problem. Now, Wallace was the second most popular man in America in 1944 behind Roosevelt. Gallup released a poll on July 20th, 1944, the day the Democratic Convention opened in Chicago. According to that poll, 65% of Americans said they wanted Wallace back as vice president. 2% said they wanted Harry Truman as vice president. At the convention, it was all set for Truman. However, Wallace gave the seconding speech for Roosevelt. The place went wild, an hour long demonstration led by among others, Adlai Stevenson and Hubert Humphrey. Uh, in the midst of that, Claude Pepper, Senator from Florida, nicknamed Red Pepper at the time, knew if he could get to the microphone in the front of the room and get Wallace's name and nomination, it would sweep the convention, defy the bosses. So he starts to fight his way to the microphone. The party bosses led by Mayor Kelly in Chicago saw what was happening and they screamed, adjourn the convention immediately, it's a fire hazard. Uh, Sam Jackson, who was chairing it, said, I have a motion to adjourn, all in favor, say aye. About 5% said aye, all opposed no, everybody screamed no. He said motion carried, meeting adjourned. At that point, Claude Pepper was five feet from the microphone. What Oliver Stone and I argue in Untold History is that had Pepper gotten to the microphone five more feet, Wallace would have been back on the ticket as vice president. There would have been certainly no atomic bombing in World War II and likely no Cold War. History can be different. That's one of the things we try to show. Uh, the, so while, uh, Roosevelt asked Wallace to stay on as, in the cabinet, Wallace chose to be Secretary of Commerce. Ro and uh, Roosevelt dies on April 12th, 1945. Truman becomes president. Almost overnight, Truman reverses Roosevelt's policies. Roosevelt's last telegram to Churchill said, I would minimize the general Soviet problem as much as possible because these problems in one form or another seem to arise every day and most of them straighten out. But that was not Truman's view. Truman admitted to everybody that he was in way over his head from the beginning, that he shouldn't be president and he was right. The first day in office, April 13th, he meets with Acting Secretary of State Statinius and with Jimmy Burns who flies up from South Carolina. And they tell Truman that the Russians have broken all of their agreements and can't be trusted. He has a meeting 10 days later with Foreign Minister Molotov. In that meeting, he berates Molotov. He accuses him of having broken all of their agreements made at Yalta. Molotov says, I've never been spoken to that way in my life. Truman says, carry out your agreements and you won't have to be spoken to like that. Stalin telegrammed them the next day to try to set him straight on what the agreements were. But from that point on, things are gonna to start to fall apart. Wallace was fighting against this, still in the cabinet, trying to convince Truman what was happening and what needed to happen and what the agreements really were and why the US and the Soviets needed to be friends moving forward in the world. The situation gets further complicated by the use of the atomic bomb. I mean, I, I spent 12 hours on this topic with my students, but I'll just make it very brief. Uh, the Soviets at Yalta agreed to come into the Pacific War three months after the end of the war in Europe. The Joint Intelligence Committee of the Joint Chiefs of Staff gave several reports saying, as soon as the Soviets come into the war, the Japanese will realize that continuing to fight is futile, that there is no hope for winning and they will end the war. We knew that, Truman knew that, Truman went to Potsdam uh, and he met, had lunch with Stalin on July 17th. 
Uh, after that meeting, he writes in his journal, Stalin will be in the Jap war by August 15th. Finny Japs when that occurs. He writes home to his wife, Bess, the next day, say the Russians are coming in, we'll end the war a year sooner now. Think of all the kids who won't be killed. Truman knew, they all knew that Soviet entry would end the war, but still the United States decided to use the bomb, even though it was militarily unnecessary and morally reprehensible. In fact, the United States had eight five-star officers in 1945. Seven of the eight are on the record saying just that, that the use of the bomb was either militarily unnecessary, morally reprehensible, or both. As Admiral Leahy said, the Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. The use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. In being the first to use it, we adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. How did the Soviets respond? The Soviets knew better than anybody the Japanese were desperate to surrender that the bomb was not necessary because the Japanese were trying to get the Soviets to intervene on their behalf to get better surrender terms. So when the, when the US decided to use the bomb, even though it was not necessary, the Soviet leaders from Stalin on down interpreted that the bomb was landed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but the real target was the Soviet Union. This was America's ruthless warning that there is nothing that's going to stop the US from achieving its goals in Europe and the Pacific. And if the Soviets interfere with this, this is what they're going to get and worse. Yeah. Wallace stayed in the cabinet and continued the struggle against the nuclear arms race and against the Cold War. And when he is fired by Truman for speaking out against US policy in September of 1946, that was the last chance for avoiding the Cold War. He was the last spokesperson anywhere near power who was, had any influence in trying to stop it. And he warned that night that this does not just mean a problem with in terms of policy, this represents the possibility of the future annihilation of life on this planet. And that's what the Cold War was about. We're lucky to have survived as a species, this insanity of the Cold War and to start it over, over again now with Russia and China is just as insane. So but we're going to show a clip, the last seven minutes of episode 10 of Untold History, which appeared first on Showtime in 2013 and has been out all over the world. The book is out in 20 languages. The documentaries are available uh, globally. China may become the first new empire to emerge in this nuclear armed world, but an empire modeled on the US or British versions would be a disaster. Great Han chauvinism would be no better than American exceptionalism. Former defense official Joseph Nye observed that the dominant powers failure to integrate the rising powers of Germany and Japan into the 20th century global system resulted in two catastrophic world wars. History must not be allowed to repeat itself again. The Chinese must shun the American example and the US must reverse course. Henry Wallace worried that if the U.S. treated the Soviets so badly when the U.S. was riding high economically and militarily, how would the Soviets treat the U.S. when and if the situation was reversed? It never happened. But this race to the bottom, he understood, would have no winner. As we close out this series, we must ask ourselves humbly, in looking back at the American century, have we acted wisely and humanely in our relations to the rest of the world? A world in which the richest few hundred or thousand or a couple thousand have more wealth than the poorest three billion? Have we been right to police the globe? Have we been a force for good, for understanding, for peace? We must look in the mirror. Have we perhaps in our self-love become the angels of our own despair? claims of victory in the Second World War and justification for the atomic bomb dropped on Japan, though aimed at the Soviet Union, were the founding myths of our domination and national security state. And the nation's elites have benefited from that. The bomb has allowed us to win by any means necessary, which makes us, because we win, right. And because we are right, we are therefore good.
Under these conditions, there is no morality but our own. As Secretary of State Madeleine Albright said, but if we have to use force, it is because we are America. We are the indispensable nation. Because we can threaten humanity with a bomb. Our mistakes are forgiven, and our cruelty is justified as benignly motivated aberrations. But domination doesn't last. Five major empires have collapsed in the lifetime of a person born before World War II. Britain, France, Germany, Japan, and the Soviet Union. Three more empires earlier in the 20th century. The Russian, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman. If history is a barometer, the United States domination will end as well. We wisely resisted becoming a colonial empire, and most Americans would deny all imperial pretensions. Perhaps that is why we cling so doggedly to the myth of American exceptionalism, American uniqueness, benevolence, generosity. Maybe in that fanciful notion lies the seeds of American redemption hope that the United States will live up to that vision which seemed within grasp in 1944 when Wallace almost became president, or 1953 when Stalin died with a new U.S. president in office, or JFK and Khrushchev in 1963, or Bush and Gorbachev in 89, or Obama in 2008. History has shown us the curve of the ball could have broken differently. These moments will come again in a different form. Will we be ready? I think back to Franklin Roosevelt on the last day of his life, cabling Churchill. I would minimize the Soviet problem as much as possible because these problems, one form or another, seem to arise every day and most of them straighten out calming down the situations that occur, letting things happen without overreacting, seeing the world through the eyes of our adversaries. This way lies in sharing in the needs of other countries with true empathy and compassion, trusting a collective will of this planet to survive the coming period, ending the threats of nuclear annihilation and global warming. Can we not surrender our exceptionalism and our arrogance? Can we not cut out the talk of domination? Can we stop appealing to God to bless America over other nations? Hardliners and nationalists will object, but theirs has proven not to be the way. A young woman said to me in the 1970s, we need to feminize this planet. I thought it strange then, but now I realize there's power in love, real power, in real love. Let us find a way back to respect the law, not of the jungle, but the law of civilization by which we first came together and put aside our differences to preserve the things that matter. Herodotus wrote in the fifth century before Christ, the first history was written in the hope of preserving from decay the remembrance of what men have been. And for that reason, the history of man is not only one of blood and death, but one also of honor, achievement, kindness, memory, and civilization. There is a way forward by remembering the past. And then we can start step by step like a baby reaching for the stars. For the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortal. Thank you for that. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Oliver. Um, our next uh, speaker is Daniel Ellsberg, perhaps the most famous whistleblower in the history of our country. Daniel was in the Marines. He is the former Defense and State Department Saigon official who revealed the Pentagon Papers, a top secret history of U.S. decision making in Vietnam, to 17 newspapers in 1971, for which he faced a possible 115 years in prison. 
Daniel is the author of The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. Uh, welcome, Daniel. All right, we've heard and we will hear a very broad analyses of what has been going on in the Cold War and the new Cold Wars that continue. I want to focus on one that was not salient to me as late as writing my most recent book, uh, The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. It was after that, actually, that I think I became aware really of the I in the military industrial complex, the MIC, uh, which I think I neglected for some 60 years or so before that of focus and obsession with our wars, our interventions, our military activities, but above all with our nuclear threats and our nuclear um, uh, buildup. Most arms control and disarmament efforts, anti-nuclear efforts, and nuclear for that matter, focus almost entirely on strategic comments, uh, concepts within the Defense Department, within the military services, and within the think tanks, which are of course part of this complex. Uh, my friend Ray McGovern says it's not just an MIC, you make the uh, uh, military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us of in 1960, and by the 61, and by the way, the original drafts of that speech, remarkable speech actually, about the unwarranted influence that might come, or actually did exist, from this military industrial complex, but it was originally called the MICC, the Military Industrial Congressional Complex. That certainly deserved part of that, but then someone noticed that he was going to deliver this speech in front of Congress and that they might take offense. So the congressional part of that came, came out. But as Ray McGovern points out, it could be well called Mickey Mac, Mickey Matt, rather, Military, Industrial, Congressional, Intelligence, uh, Media, Academic, and uh, Think Tank. Uh, at least, I was, of course, in a think tank working for the Air Force in particular, the Rand Corporation. And in those days, um, I would say you could you could work year after year and you can read all of these books, which I have behind me here, and look at the index and look for the name Boeing or Lockheed or uh, North Grumman or uh, General Dynamics. They're just not there as though they were just tradesmen who were doing the bidding of the strategists in uh, the White House, in the Pentagon, in Ellsworth, and the Rand Corporation. Uh, not their influence at all. It was after my book came out uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, that I came across this book, Harry S. Truman and the War Scare of 1948. And it put me onto a whole new line of analysis. And I'll, I'll try to summarize the message that came through to me there, which was actually new to me. Uh, after all these years. During the Second World War, uh, the majority of our planes were actually built by Ford and GM. And when the war ended very in August and the orders were abruptly canceled for new war planes, Ford and GM went back to building cars very happily, really pent up wartime demand. But other companies like Lockheed and Douglas and Martin Others that had built up from almost nothing before the war, from very small to enormous profits and uh, gross, but also profits on investments that were mainly made by the government and, and uh, supplied on lease, in effect, to these countries, to these companies who had made enormous profits on their invested capital, which was relatively small. Suddenly, they found that their market had vanished. And to some extent, they tried to uh, satisfy a civilian need for civilian aircraft or even go into other businesses uh, like uh, building uh, buses or uh, other vehicles. And they couldn't compete commercially with Ford or GM or any of the others who were used to cost benefit analysis and efficiency. They had been built up on uh, cost plus contracts, which essentially paid almost no attention at all to cost. And they were not built up to, they were not simply built to compete in a commercial market. They were all facing going bankrupt, literally bankrupt. 
Uh, their orders, as I say, went from almost one day to the next in August of 1945, from enormous to nothing. And they had, were, were desperate. Some of them did go bankrupt, but others were looking. So we have only three alternatives that keep up this cutthroat competition between us or to emerge and somehow as one put, have less mouths to feed here or something or go bankrupt. And the answer was that they had, as during the war, had to have orders from, from uh, the executive branch, from the military, for large numbers of war planes. Well, it was peacetime, uh, in a sense. Uh, but that wasn't uh, appropriate. What was needed was preparation for war, readiness for war all the time, essentially a permanent war economy. And with this, uh, and they got it. Uh, starting lobbying in uh, early 46, actually. And uh, before that, uh, long, uh, not long after that, uh, pressing Truman to uh, appoint a air power commission to see what the requirements were under Thomas Finletter. Yes, I knew about the Finletter report. I didn't know as a result of lobbying by the aircraft industry, but it did point out that we absolutely had to have a lot of airplanes. Uh, the Air Force itself also with its new independence or striving for independence at that point, which it got, uh, wanted to emphasize a strategic bombing campaign that they'd carried on in World War II, but against who? They wanted it in part because they wanted a healthy aircraft industry, which would have a large research and development arm that had to be paid for by government. The commercial aviation simply wouldn't support that. They needed that so as to be superior even with a relatively small Air Force to have the latest planes as we're still striving to do, of course, uh, with some uh, dogs coming along, like the F-35, the, the uh, uh, biggest boondoggle, with my, actually the biggest arms project uh, in history, you know, ultimately perhaps a trillion and a half dollars, happens to be uh, almost uh, clearly uh, a terrible project. <laughs> its, its functions are done better by other planes entirely. But the headline in the New York Times recently was too big to fail. I, like the commercial firms, uh, Lockheed's uh, F-35. Very recently now, just to bring this right up to date, William Hartung, H-A-R-T-U-N-G, of the Center for International Policy, has put out a very interesting report uh, called Inside the ICBM Lobby. Uh, and uh, uh, let me, I'm sorry, I'm, let me go back for just a moment to the earlier period. You needed a lot of planes for, a, for an industry, the Air Force needed them for an industry that would have, allow you to have the most superior planes later in a big R&D budget and to have a large share of the military budget and to be independent as an Air Force. The aerospace industry needed the Air Force, a large Air Force that they could sell to, and a Navy as it built up its carrier uh, planes and got uh, more extensive on the strategic mission also in Polaris in the missiles. So we got an aerospace, you know, a missile industry, not only aircraft. This book has really suggested to me that a very large part of the Cold War, not all of it, but a very large part that I've certainly neglected, I would say for most of my life until quite recently, is the function of a massive annual subsidy to the aerospace industry, to assure it of uh, to be healthy, that it doesn't collapse, doesn't get bankrupt. And that uh, has continued every year uh, from, as I say, the late 40s, before the Berlin blockade, by the way, even, uh, which contributed its part to the Cold War or Korea. Uh, all of these were important turning points, but at the key points, uh, every point there's the role of the aircraft industry has been very, very important and very neglected. And as I say, you can read many books about this without reading the names of the five that I just mentioned, which are in Hartung's uh, accounts. Hartung, by the way, is one of the very biggest experts on the role of the military industrial complex. And I recommend that you look him up on the web 
and in the Center for International Policy, he's had many op-eds on this. Unfortunately, he's almost alone in this and the people who work with him at the center. But uh, Raytheon right now is uh, the sole contractor of the uh, for the new ICBM. And I, it makes me laugh a little because the reason they're sold is they were competing with Boeing and then Northrop bought away from the Boeing team, uh, the maker of solid fuel rockets and incorporated it, uh, acquired it as an asset in Boeing. So we can't compete now regularly. It's not a fair field. And so it's left to Boeing, which of course has many sun contractors, including Lockheed and many of the others. Um, there is no real reason for us to be building and follow on to our current ICBMs, the 400 Minuteman 3 that are in three bases in uh, Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, except for the needs of the aerospace industry, the profits, the lobbying, and its jobs, uh, the uh, upkeep of towns like Minot, North Dakota, which depend on their Minuteman wing near them, or others, Cheyenne in Wyoming, and uh, Utah, by the way, where the missiles are serviced, the ICBM lobby, and I won't go into the details here, is named in the Hartung book. And I think that's very important that we need to focus on that from an arms control point of view, just as in the climate problem. Again, you can read book after book after book on climate, as I have, and look in the index for the word Exxon or Chevron. Aramco or British Petroleum, and oddly, you just don't see it there. The media doesn't deal with it. The analysts don't deal with it. In fact, as in the aerospace case, these are the people we are confronting. These are the institutions, the centers of power. Uh, it's not just uh, a wrong errors in people's minds. It's uh, profits, jobs, donations, uh, revolving door uh, between the, in the aerospace case, especially between the Defense Department, our current Secretary of Defense, having come from the board of Raytheon, uh, uh, which he got into having come immediately from the military uh, back and forth. And uh, the Boeing and uh, Raytheon and others, Lockheed, have financed people uh, since then. Another excellent article is uh, by a man named Cummings, uh, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, a play on the uh, film name, but an extremely good article, which you can find on the web, about Lockheed's efforts to staff the Defense Department with officials from the Lockheed Corporation very effectively and to, to get the orders from them. The cost of this for the American people is the preservation of ICBMs that should not exist, which endanger the United States by their existence as vulnerable fixed site uh, missiles that can only survive an attack by getting off the ground before enemy missiles should arrive. It is that consideration, use them or lose them, that puts the famous 10 minute or so uh, window on the ability of a president to make a decision as to whether to launch our forces, essentially our ICBMs, which run very quick alert within minutes, they can be flying. And if they aren't, and, and a, uh, an attack is coming, we will lose them. Now, a question could be, so what? A war between the US and Russia, if it starts, will lead to a nuclear winter by the firestorms created in cities on both sides and in Europe and in China and elsewhere, which will send uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, 150 million tons perhaps of soot and black smoke into the stratosphere, will, will not rain out, will go around the world within days and cut out 70% of sunlight for years, to some extent up to 10 years, Human species, most of it doesn't last that long. It means that harvests are all killed all over the world. Much of the world is ice age conditions during the one. Uh, people starve, whether you go first or second. So most of the weapons in our submarines as well, highly accurate weapons for killing Russian ICBMs also, again, like our ICBMs, 
and the ICBMs, which are vulnerable, unlike the sub-launch missiles, ICBMs, each of them is capable of causing nuclear winter. And the ICBMs in particular, that is, they constitute a doomsday machine. And the ICBMs are the hair trigger on that doomsday machine, the ones that compel the president to consider launching on tactical warning within minutes. In short, it would be worth a hundred billion dollars or more. What, what would it take to get rid of them? In other words, to, uh, to hire people, and you may have to do that in a transition period for the workers, to retrain them, to hire them not to build ICBMs. That would be worth a lot of money. It wouldn't take as much as actually building them actually does, which would be over there the life of the new ICBMs, the uh, 204, 649, pretty precise figure they give, but 246, 49 billion dollars, a third of it, uh, a quarter of a trillion dollars. So, but a hundred million in the procurement stage first that could be put to urgent needs, obviously, of other, of other sorts. Why is this happening? I would say for little other reason than the, uh, the effective political influence of these concentrated handful of corporations. So that's the problem. Uh, can, we, can we deal with it? Uh, the, uh, that remains to be seen, but it can't be proved yet that we can't. We don't have a record that, that gives us actual hope in Congress, which has been largely bought by the fossil fuel and the aerospace and such other concentrations of power, the president as well, the media, which reflect these interests. Uh, can we, practically speaking, change it? We haven't shown that we can. We have reduced uh, the actual number of warheads on both sides by more than 80%. That looks impressive. It has not reduced the risk or the effect of a nuclear war between US and Russia at all. No difference. Uh, the ICBMs would make a difference. So I've used up my time here on a relatively narrow subject aspect of the Cold War, but uh, I think one that we have to come to grips with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ellsberg.